Good morning, everybody. I'm Doran Lancet. I'm the local uh, committee head. Together with Amit Kahana, we have arranged this conference. I would like to call upon the chair of ILASOL, uh, Amri Vandel, Professor Amri Vandel from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, <coughs> for two minutes about the conference. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Doron. We are on a junction in astrobiology. So about half a year ago, all the media learned about the eventual life in the clouds of Venus. Of course, the discovery of the phosphine, phosphine which has in the uh, meanwhile been con uh, not so sure, but the leader on this research, uh, Sarah Seeger is our guest speaker at the end of the conference. So this is a way where we may discover life in exoplanets by a similar method. Just one month ago, the world stood still when uh, the mission to Mars, the Perseverance landed, and this mission is about to start a research on uh, which may find ancient life in Mars. And uh, in just a uh, half a year ago, uh, in front of us, the James Webb Space Telescope will be in space. And this is the telescope which may bring us the first uh, bio biosignatures, the first signs of extraterrestrial biological life ever. So I really wish you a great conference. We'll hear about all these things and more. The first virtual conference and a big thank you to Amit and Doron for organizing this 34th meeting of ILASOL. Thank you. Okay, next will be Zahri Pilpel. He is the chairperson of the Department of Molecular Genetics that hosts, if we, it were, weren't for being Zoom, it would be here in this department. Zachi, please. Thank you, Doron. Thank you, Amit, for organizing this from the, from the program. It looks, uh, it promises to be a fantastic uh, uh, day. Uh, I'm excited to welcome all of you. Uh, it would have been nicer if we could welcome you in person, uh, maybe next year. Um, being uh, an old member of this uh, Iloso tradition, uh, I must reflect on uh, memories from uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, somewhat closer to the origin of life itself, uh, where we used to have those conferences mainly at the Faculty of Agriculture, uh, Noam Lahav back then, the late, and uh, Schneur Lifson uh, were among the pioneers of this uh, society in Israel. And it's uh, so exciting to see how it developed and evolved over the years. Uh, the conference today is very diverse, bringing in people from chemistry, biology, physics, uh, even philosophy, uh, astronomy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This promises to be a very multidisciplinary attack or approach to a question that I still agree. Uh, I agree that it's still the, the 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 most outstanding and important question that biologists. Uh, haven't solved yet. Uh, and I'm not sure if a solution would come, but definitely the thoughts towards it are going to be very provocative, very uh, uh, engaging, and they will advance our science and our way of thinking about uh, biology uh, in, in very, very interesting and unpredictable ways. Without further ado, I think we should start. We have a very exciting program for today. Um, and the first session that I will chair is the session on biology. As you saw, there is a very interesting arrangement to this conference going from biology to biochemistry, chemistry, and astrobiology. Uh, so we start now the session on biology. And our first speaker is Dan Taufik from the, the Weizmann Institute of Science. And he will talk on from so simple beginning, uh, how did the first proteins evolve? The focus of my research is enzymes. Enzymes are the key to life. Basically, nothing will happen without them. 
Um, they include molecules such as ATP synthase <coughs> that converts a, a proton gradient into, into ATP, or RecA, a DNA recombinase, which is absolutely critical for the replication of the genome. And the focus of my research has been to understand how these immensely complex uh, molecules with fantastic performances have evolved. And if I were to summarize 20 years of research in one sentence, I would say that we've dis we and others have discovered that enzyme evolution regards the recruitment of pre-existing enzymes to perform new functions by a process of mutation of selection. And actually what you discover is that teaching old dogs, meaning older enzymes, new tricks is actually not so difficult. And this process of teaching old dogs new tricks <clears throat> explains the expansion of enzyme families and superfamilies by the gene duplication that creates redundant copies and mutation and selection to create new family members. So phylogenetic trees like the one represented shown here represent this expansion from an early progenitor. However, what we don't know is really how the, did the very first family member emerge that eventually gave rise to this entire diversity. And so the key question, I think, in the, the field of protein evolution is how did the old dog come about? How did the very first enzymes molecules that now represent entire families and superfamilies came about. And we can postulate several things regarding the emergence of the earliest proteins. The first postulate is that the emergence has to come from relatively short polypeptides for two reasons in short, one being that the what, whatever the protein synthesis machinery was at the time, it must have not been relatively primitive. Also because protein translation depends on other proteins. And second, that the emergence of protein from, for, from random sequences regards a probability which is proportional to one over 20 to the power of length. So the shorter the polypeptide, the higher the chances it will emerge. The second postulate is that emergence would be from a minimal abiotic amino acid alphabet. Those amino acids that are found uh, to be synthesized spontaneously in experiments of the style of Miller-Urey or in meteorites. I, I think we will hear a talk about recent developments in, the, in this field. But that emergence may should not depend on amino acids whose sole source is biosynthesis. That for making them, you need many other proteins. And the third postulate, which is maybe not so common, but in my view is, is evident, is self-assembly. The only way by which a short peptide can assume the structural volume and complexity that we see in, in you know, modern enzymes or anything close to a modern enzyme uh, is by self-assembly, by many peptides coming together to form some kind of a structure that, as I said, has enough volume and complexity to exert biochemical function. So these are the three postulates. And then how do we tackle such a question of, of understanding how the progenitors of the earliest enzymes evolved. To address this question, perhaps the first question one needs to ask is what did the first enzymes do? Because currently enzymes perform many, many different functions uh, in metabolism, in replication, in synthesis, and so on and so forth. So I will not go into detail, this is published work, but we did some systematic analysis that indicated that the first enzymes had one common denominator, and that is that they used ligands, metabolites that contain the phosphate group as cofactor or substrate. This comes from looking at the catalog of the 
about 2,000 enzyme families and superfamilies, each of which represents an independent emergence, and looking for what unites them in, in function. What you see circled here in red are superfamilies that are now comprise hundreds of different enzymes. And they share a common denominator, as I said, in binding and utilizing phospholigands. And just to give you an idea, if you take just two of these superfamilies called Rossmann and Pidupen TPases, maybe these names don't mean much to most of you, but 40% of the enzymes, or sorry, of the proteins with known structure in prokaryote genomes belong to these two families. So they are clearly central to the enzyme world and, and to life in general. The second thing that we looked at is how did the first proteins bind phospholigands? Turns out that there is a very interesting trend. Phosphate is bound in all these early lineages by the tip at the tip of the, uh, an alpha helix. The phosphate would sit like a cork plugging a bottle, which is the alpha helix at the end terminus. And further, <clears throat> you see that the N helix is a hotspot for phosphate binding only under one condition. And that is if you say, give me short and simple sequences that bind phosphate, then the only mode of binding that complies is actually this N terminal helix that provides this nest of hydrogen bonds that you see here. Because if you look at all independent emergences of phosphate binding throughout 4 billion years of evolution, the N helix, which is this cyan here, is merely 12%. If you ever, however, filter this through these simplifying constraints of length and abiotic amino acids, it becomes 62%. And overall, we have mapped uh, in the last 10 years, I would say, several of these very early elements that mediate phosphate binding and are found in them now what are the most abundant lineages, which are, as I mentioned, <coughs> Rossmann and Pilupen TPases. And these are embedded in these beta phosphate binding loop or P loop alpha helix elements. So we came to the conclusion that this is kind of the earliest progenitor that we can reconstruct today uh, by deduction, by parsimony, by phylogeny, are these elements of, again, beta strand, P-loop, alpha helix. And about 10 years ago, we began to attempt to, to reconstruct proteins that are based on this element and explore their um, their properties. Um, and the basic sequence motif is, as you see here, is something like 30 amino acids containing uh, the beta strand, which is highly hydrophobic, the phosphate binding loop that follows what is called the Walker A motif, and this alpha helix. And with the aid of, of computational design and a bit of luck, we were able to get these proteins. And this has been published uh, three years ago, but today I want to share with you uh, more recent results where Pratik, via a postdoc in the lab, has attempted to do two things. The first thing was to shorten this protein. So now we have these versions that are roughly 40 amino acids that are basically this basic beta strand p loop helix element just with a short solubilizing helix. And to make use of results we've obtained before that show that they bind, that they tend to bind single-stranded DNA to see if these peptides may have functions that resemble helicases and recombinases that are today absolutely essential for genome replication, but actually there are critical also even for RNA self-replication, because the key challenge for a self-replicating molecule is that once you have created the complementary strand, this is the end of it. Then the cycle cannot continue unless you displace 
the complementary strand and allow a new primer or a new initiation to occur to get another cycle of replica replication. So molecules such as helicases or recombinases would be absolutely critical for any like self-replicating species, if you like, or rudimentary organism that uses nucleic acids as the uh, for, for the genomic information, genetic information. And so we've applied this very basic helicase assay by which you have double-stranded DNA with a fluorophore and quencher. So this fluoresces. However, if you have an helicase that will open these, will separate these strands, the strands will collapse into this hairpin structure that will result in the quencher being next to the fluorophore and loss of fluorescence. And lo and behold, this is exactly what you see when you add these fragments to this, to this uh, probe. But this is a single turnover of saying, okay, we have a double-stranded DNA, say the product of some, some replication. These peptides can induce strand separation. Question is, can we release the single strands? for another cycle, say, of replication? And answer is we can, owing to the fact that these primordial phosphate binding loops are generous. So let me just say one thing, that in the modern proteins, if you will look at this P-loop or the Walker A, what you will see is that these loops bind primarily ATP, sometimes GTP, very rarely some other nucleotides that contain phosphate. These Walker A motifs do not bind DNA or other phospholigands. In contrast, this primordial P loop is a generalist that can bind essentially anything that has a phosphate group. So it would bind to single stranded DNA or RNA to induce separation, as you saw here. But then the single stranded DNA can be released by adding small molecules that contain phosphates such as ATP or GTP, but even triphosphate, because recognition is only of the phosphate groups. The nucleotides are not recognized. But perhaps the most interesting of all is that these uh, primordial P-loops are highly fond of polyphosphate, which is a polymer containing anything from, from six or seven phosphate groups up to hundreds of phosphate groups linked together. And the interesting thing about polyphosphate is that Arthur Kornberg was actually the first to speculate that polyphosphate was the precursor of ATP. He called it like energy fossil. Because chemically speaking, polyphosphate can do anything that ATP can do and even better. It just doesn't have the recognition handle of the adenosine. And further, what Otto Kornberg discovered was an enzyme that is present in each and every organism that can take polyphosphate and ADP to synthesize ATP and vice versa. So it's totally exchangeable with ATP, polyphosphate, and these primordial P-loops just love polyphosphate. As you can see, they bind polyphosphate with affinity, which is at least 100-fold higher than ATP. So this was actually the, a demonstration that a short polypeptide of about 40 amino acids, which is already a pretty complex molecule, can nonetheless perform the functions that immensely complex molecules like REC A that comprise thousands of amino acids and actex molecular machines uh, can be mimicked to some degree by very simple polypeptides. And we think that these are relics of what one might call as an RNA, RNA peptide world where you have nucleic acids acting jointly with amino acids and short peptides, and where modulation of nucleic acids, binding them, stabilizing them, enabling replication by separating strands and so on, is a key element. Uh, further, in, in support of the 
of these postulates for, for early emergence, I can say that, you know, we could demonstrate relatively, it's all relative, relatively short peptides relative to modern proteins. It is much, uh, 10 times at least smaller. Emergence is from a minimal abiotic amino acid alphabet. So actually these peptides are comprised only of abiotic amino acids, such as uh, glue, isoleucid, valine, and so on, with one exception, which is this lysine that sits on the, on the phosphate binding loop that I will discuss in a moment. So this is the second postulate. And the third postulate of self-assembly, clearly these peptides do not act as, as monomers soluble in solution. They oligomerize in a very dynamic way, shifting between tetramers, four molecule containing uh, assemblies, to up to 30 peptides assembled together. And they also change the quaternary structure depending on the ligand. So self-assembly is critical for their function. And so this is the, the first part. In the first part, second part, I would like to address a second question that relates to the ancient nucleic acid binding motifs. I've shown you one, which is the P-loop that we discovered is actually a nucleic acid binding motif, not just a ATP binding motif. But we have addressed another one, also with a specific question in mind that I'll mention in a second, and which is called the helix help in helix or HHH for, for short. And this is a very simple motif that comprises a helix, a hairpin, a short loop, and another helix that binds nucleic acid also via the end terminal of the helix, as, as, as I've shown you, which is a hallmark of ancient motifs. And it is also comprised of simple abiotic amino acids such as proline, glycine, isoleucine, valine, and so on. And we aim to, to reconstruct the evolution of this fold. And to do so, we chose this, uh, what's called HHH2, which is basically two HHH motifs fused together, the product of, of gene duplication. And this is a protein found in many polymerases and other proteins, which mediates double-stranded DNA binding. And using phylogenetic methods, we could take the sequences of all known contemporary HHH2 proteins and reverse, if you like, this process of emergence from a single peptide segment that got duplicated and fused to give the modern proteins. Um, and in doing so, we could reconstruct First, the last common HHH2 ancestor, which is the sequence of which you can see here, which is a protein of 64 residues made of 15 different amino acids, and that has almost 50% symmetry in the sequence. So you can see that it's a product of duplication, but it's not perfectly symmetrical, like looking like you know, the first sequence after duplication. And this protein is actually looks like any modern HHH2 protein for any purpose, including high affinity binding to double-stranded DNA. We then went to infer more ancient forms of this protein by doing two things. The first was to symmetrization, because the idea is that this is the product of duplication of a primordial peptide, and duplication would create a sequence that is like there is 100% identity between the two halves. And this is what you see here as the primordial HHH2. As Dan, the two halves are, are completely, sorry? Dan, five minutes till the question session. Uh, and this could be done, and this protein is functional, but it has one caveat, and that is that 14 out of 64 residues are basic. They are basic amino acids such as lysine, arginine, or histidine. And we have something which is called the basic amino acid conundrum. On the one hand, we know that basic amino acids are absolutely critical for 
nucleic acid binding, as you see in this analysis. However, they are not found amongst the abiotic set. None of the contemporary basic amino acids is found in miliary experiments or in meteorites. And we went to, to try to, to address this conundrum. And the solution we thought about is that maybe amino acids that currently serve as intermediates in, bio, in amino acid biosynthesis could have been the part of the early proteins. And specifically what attracted our attention is an amino acid called ornithine. Ornithine is not part of modern proteins. However, it has been found in meteorites and it is also found in the Miller-Urey experiment at low concentrations. And to, to show that ornithine or to examine whether ornithine can function in these early protein forms, uh, because ornithine cannot be incorporated by the modern protein synthesis machinery, Norman Metanis at the Hebrew University has made an artificial synthetic protein that is 100% symmetry and where every basic amino acid was replaced by ornithine. And indeed, we could find this protein folds to give the HHH2 structure, and it also shows DNA binding. Binding is much weaker than the ancestral HHH2 that I discussed before, but there is specific binding of, of double-stranded DNA. But ornithine has another cool feature, and that is that using a very simple chemical reaction that was actually described by Mayer Vilcek, you can modify side chains of ornithine with reagents as simple as uh, cyanamide to form arginine. So if you like, arginine can be a post-translational modification of, of ornithine. However, of course, such a reaction would be statistical. Unlike genetic incorporation that would say, give me arginine at this position and only at this position, applying these reagents gives you a statistical mixture by way in which every protein molecule has different ornithine side chains modified to arginine. Nonetheless, the statistical ornithine to arginine modification improves the double-stranded DNA binding, bringing it almost to the level of the modern proteins. In a similar way, we could show that even if a protein is based entirely on acidic amino acids, it can fold with the assistance of reagents such as polyamine that will induce folding at sub-millimolar concentrations, or even magnesium or calcium ions. So all these things provide solutions to, you know, how did the first proteins manage without the basic amino acids we know today? An interesting property was discovered of the pre-duplicated segment, this peptide of 30 amino acids, that actually forms phase separation, that forms these cause acervates upon the addition of, of RNA, poly U. These droplets are formed and these are thought or suggested to have been early uh, forms of cells or protocells. So we could describe altogether a trajectory that leads from a short peptide to a fully structured and functional DNA binding protein that goes within intermediates where actually self-assembly is mediated by coacervates. So overall, I've shown you like that we can provide examples for emergence that comply with these three postulates, that they occur from relatively short polypeptides that are based only on abiotic amino acids, and that oligomerization or even simpler forms of self-assembly such as phase separation is a key element in allowing um, these peptides despite their simplicity to perform biochemical function. Lastly, I'd like to show you who led the, the, this work. Obviously, I didn't do any of these experiments. Pratik Vyas is behind the, the P-loop. Dragana and Liam led the ornithine project that I showed.
and Jagoda Jablonska did much of the bioinformatics related to, to both projects. And thanks for, for your attention. Thank you, Danny. That was uh, fantastic. Um, so the way questions will be uh, delivered here is through the chat and uh, Doron and Amit uh, will read them uh, aloud. Uh, so do we have uh, questions already? Yes, we have uh, two questions that I see here. The first one is, um, does short protein have any catalytic activity that you can point to? So now we are actually characterizing, uh, I'm not sure I would call it catalytic in the sense that uh, I can discuss it in a moment, but, but they, we could show that they, these fragments mediate phosphoryl transfer they definitely have the ability to mediate transfer of phosphate, say from what we call adenylate kinase activity, to take two ATP molecules, for example, and synthesize ATP and AMP from them. So they can mediate phosphoric transfer, obviously with very low rates, so, and with very weak turnover, yeah? So I'm not sure they would come up, but, but we are also doing some theoretical work to show that even very slow rates can be immensely useful at the early stages of, of evolution of, of metabolism. So yeah, we have to start from somewhere. Sorry? We have to start no, from somewhere. A traditional argument, but the question is whether this uh, somewhere can, can provide an advantage. So answer is, you know, if you take ADP in solution, you leave it there for millions of years, you will never see ATP. But if you add to these proteins, you will see ATP. So this is in a nutshell. Okay. The reason um, why despite very low activity, they, they can be still useful. Um, so the other question is, why would ornithin be displaced by other basic residues uh, in the modern genetic code? Do you so have a theory? For, for, for a few reasons. One is that I mean, binding and folding are Im improved significantly as these ornithine side chains are modified into arginines, as I've shown, even statistically, let alone if you will genetically replace them. The second thing is that the tRNA ornithine would be very unstable. This was the initial argument as to why ornithine was excluded from the genetic code is because the ornithine can, can go through this auto closure. So if you would load tRNA with ornithine, they would, uh, the ornithine would cyclize and, and drop off the, the tRNA. This has been the, at least the original argument, but as far as I know, no one actually tested how stable or unstable the tRNA adducts would be. Okay, thank you, Danny. 